I wonderful we are now live so welcome to higher ground facebook live um my name is harriet festing and i'm director of the higher ground network which is the largest flood survivor network in the country and i'm joined by helen lekovich a flood survivor advocate leader of what was formerly flood lothian five and then became many, many more than five and is now Flood Lothian, Middle Lothian in Middle, the village of Middle Lothian in Illinois. Uh, Helen, before I start to you, I just want to remind everyone that if you are watching this and your community is affected by flooding and you need solutions, join Higher Ground. First join the Higher Ground Facebook page and then just private message me on Facebook or find my email address on our website, Higher Ground, um, and then we'll actually get you connected into the network. We can help you. So Helen, um, when I speak to you, it feels a little bit like coming back home. Um, you, it was really through working with you that you inspired us to set up Higher Ground. It was the work with you that was just so inspiring. Um, and I really remember that our first contact, my guess is it was either April or May 2013, and you called my offices for my former job then. It was afterwards I went on to set up Higher Ground. Just tell me a little bit more about why you called and the circumstances that you were in then. Okay, so that would have been in 2013. And I'd lived in this house since 1988. And I'd already had, I think this is a shirt. Well, no, at that time, 50, yeah, 15 floods. And um, in 2013 was the first flood I slept through. And I wasn't able to get ahead of it. And I wasn't able to kind of try to minimize losing some of my belongings and property. So um, I would say that was my breaking point and I was looking beyond my village because we'd called my village so many times that I had to call somewhere else and somebody mentioned to me, have you called CNT? And she told me that her son, you know, made her aware of this agency. So I had called you and you were the water director. And I remember looking at my watch and it was about 20 minutes. We had been talking and I couldn't believe you were still listening. And I remember kind of raising my voice and saying, why are you still listening to me? Because nobody else wanted to hear what, what we had to say. It was always lip service and you seemed genuinely concerned. And um, from there, it just felt like we were magic. You know, with you behind us, all that guidance, everywhere you steered me, all you said was, go there and talk and be yourself. And um, previously, I believe each resident would try to approach this alone. And so in this particular case, before I called you, I'd already gone door to door to the 12 homes on my block. And I'd asked them to join me at a, at a city board meeting together. Um, and then with you giving us ideas, we just followed those instructions, kept doing our research, and that's how we all began. So the kind of flooding that affected Midlothian is the kind of flooding that, you know, for many people who it's not their main life, don't really think about. It's not the coast flooding. Tell me a little bit more about the source of the flooding and, and what that looked and felt like in Midlothian once it flooded? Well, the first year that it happened, it was kind of uh, baffling, really, because we couldn't figure out where the water was coming from. And it would come, you know, it, it just would come from southwest of here, but we didn't quite understand where it was coming from because that particular creek is 10 blocks away. And so we would drive all over and try to find the source, but it was confusing because there's actually two creeks in Midlothian and the one that's closer wasn't causing this. So it took um, years, you know, you're trying to protect your home. So you're, you're at home and you're going through all of your things and trying to protect everything. And at the same time, you're trying to go figure out where in the world is this coming from. We would have to um, 
Well, when this first started, the first probably three, four, five years, we had to drive and find a pump to rent. We would go to a heavy machinery place and we'd have to get that and we would have to go to Menards and we would buy sand and we would make our own sandbags. And we, you know, it was this big, huge ordeal. Um, eventually we bought our own pump. You know, we realized this was never going to end. But when we would reach out to our own village, every time they said, we're working on it. And yet we would drive around and we could never find anybody working on it. So um, each time it happened, we just felt it was important that we get to know our problem. If we were going to have to do this on our own and reach out outside to other agencies, we were going to have to fully comprehend it. So we traced this creek all the way to its origin and we began to study it during storms. We, we knew at this point, several years in, that if the news predicted a three inch rain, we knew we were going to flood. So literally the creek that overbanks is 10 blocks away and it makes its way here and it inundates the block I live on and it can't get off. It'll fill these homes because the elevation is, you know, these homes are so much lower than everything that's around it that we literally have to pump it to get it out of here or it'll continue to fill the home. So we uh, took a lot of pictures, we did a lot of video and we started at the source and we discovered quite a few of unpleasant things, you know, from our upstream community issue where this originates. And as we pursued that, things got more difficult. We weren't even getting help, honestly, at that point in 2013 and 14 from our own village leaders. Right, right, right. I'm gonna sort of jump to the end and then kind of track back. Okay. So I, What's what's been so wonderful, you know, I love to tell your story because you've had success uh, and, and just a summary of the success and, you know, you can add to my list because I often forget I, I have to write them down. So you right now, I believe, are having built a multi-million dollar flood control project. Um, yeah. You most incredibly, and this is the most wonderful story, you voted out your mayor, your unsupportive uh, mayor, really on a landslide. I mean, it was in the local newspapers oh, about yeah. how badly she lost. You also we voted actually, out several trustees. We voted out a board as well. So it wasn't just the mayor. There were other elected officials, and we worked very hard, and the landslide was over an 85% is how I, I remember being over 85%, which was quite shocking, really. It was the biggest landslide on the south side of Chicago for an incumbent mayor to lose of that, that percentage. Right, right. And you got in, um, oh, you joined the community rating system, which means that residents now can have reduced rates of uh, flood insurance. Uh, you got in grants in order to uh, install nature-based approaches to managing flooding. I remember permeable paving, large-scale rain gardens. Yes. You yourselves personally dug rain gardens. Because we knew, we knew all along that we had to show them what was possible. We didn't feel that there was anybody leading us in that direction, and we wanted agencies to take us seriously. We wanted people to want to invest in us. And therefore we felt that we had to do everything humanly possible from our end. And it was, um, we built a lot of good relationships among other residents, you know, working on these projects together, trying to inspire people on what they could do to take the edge off their own water problems and their own properties by giving them an example of these gardens, these rain gardens that we were, you know, putting in highly visible areas. And people would drive out to watch those gardens work during storms. It became like a drive-in movie for people to come out and watch our gardens. So we think we accomplished that inspiration there. And the other thing that, that I think you have done in a way uh, that is just incredible is that you made it fun. We did. Uh, we made protest really highly visible, creative protest, and you made people want to join in because you made it fun. Yes. And your extraordinary capacity 
to just kind of direct everyone to do what you wanted them to do. So if you would come in with this huge awe and you would just tell everyone they all had to stand behind it. And there was this sort of sense of camaraderie and even those people who you were fighting against yeah. would all yeah. come and join and stand behind the awe. Yeah, tell I have my travel lore with me here today for the interview, Harriet. We don't go anywhere without these oars because the long and the short of it is a lot of people have these problems and they're forgotten. And I made up my mind on day one that nobody was ever going to forget that we walked into that room and said something about this flooding. They were never going to forget us. That's why we bring the props. That's why we wear the t-shirts. We have so many t-shirts, so many slogans, and um, that's where the sense of humor came in because this is not funny. And in order to continue going, you have to find a way um, to relate to people and meet them where they're at and find something that together, you know, that we can smile with each other to get us through it. So our t-shirts, our slogans, our oars, our banners, we, you know, we felt that we were walking around as advertising with our t-shirts. And on the back, they actually say, follow us on Facebook, Fladolcian Madolcian. Um, it says, I survived the Midlothian tsunami. Team Fladolcian, catch the wave. When we get wet, we get wild. You know, it was all these slogans where, oh, uh, keep calm and damn it, in terms of, you know, damn the water. And the very first slogan was Team Fladolcian, um, come hell or high water. Because I told everybody it was going to be Helen or the water, but one of us was going to win. And I don't think a lot of people ever even knew that that was my meaning behind that slogan. You know, come hell or high water. It's going to be me or the water. But one of us <laughs> is going to win. And the hats, the rain hats and coats. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and the cookies. The cookies. I, the cookies. I mean, you know, we would come for the cookies. And the cupcakes <laughs> with the umbrellas in them. Um, and the banners, and we marched in every parade, and we built really super clever parade floats, uh, one of them that resembled a flood, but it was really cheerful and fun, like nobody would miss that we had built this huge, you know, flood rolling, um, and, and we branched, I'm, I'm sorry, we rolled that whole parade to end into a big community outreach and, and education opportunity, by hosting a luau, because what do you do when you have water and sand? You have a luau. And so, you know, we just tried to make these opportunities for people who had these stories to come together, to, to have conversations with each other, to know that they weren't alone, to know that we were all going to eventually help each other stick together and, and move forward and learn from what we'd already known and hopefully continue to, as we like to call it, brainstorm here. So I know that um, many, of the, many of the flood survivor groups we work with, and we work with are coming up to 50 groups now, a lot of them go through a really tough time. They, you know, I have many Facebook messages saying, I'm giving up. I, this is, I've had enough. You must have had that on many occasions. What's your kind of message of hope? Have you got one? I do. Um, and it's kind of a motto within the group itself is when you have those moments, we talk it out with our core group. There's a good four or five of us who see each other regularly. And we allow the worst of the worst of our feelings to be shared there, whether it's crying or screaming or punching, not each other, but you know, if we feel the need to have to let that steam off, we do that together. And that way, when we walk back out in public, we've always known that we have to be in, um, you know, respectful and in control of our emotions and stick to the facts because nobody cares how we feel. Um, you know, we, we have to stick to what our, our mission is and be taken seriously by being productive in our public um, presentations. So um, I think that we're just able to kind of hold each other up. And in the end, we, you know, as time goes by, you realize that if you quit now, it was all for nothing. 
and there was a lot of personal sacrifice. And at the beginning of it all, I can remember saying these same things from beginning to, to now. And sometimes it bothers me that I don't think people remember. I say, if you remember one thing I've said, it is that every human being deserves a quality of life. And the reason we're doing this is because we're all human beings in this together. And each one of us deserves a quality of life. And when you think about it in the grand scheme of things, a house is most people's largest investment. And I did a lot of the research on just some of the numbers. Um, I, did, I did think about this yesterday again. The population here in Midlothian is approximately 14,500. The, the medium household income is about $61,000. Um, the average house value is about $149,000. I want you to think about that in terms of just me alone. 12 floods, 13, 14, 15. You know, in 2013, we had 15 floods. In 2014, we had nine more floods in 14 weeks. Now, think about those numbers. If my household income was 61,000 and you're sustaining 20, 30, 40, 50,000 of damages that are never covered by insurance. I'm not in a floodplain, by the way. How long do you think I can survive it? So I recognized that and thought, if I can't, how many other people can? Because these are our numbers. Nobody can afford this. And there's no amount of insurance or federal assistance that's ever going to be enough. You know from the, the study that was done, the prevalence of urban, of urban flooding. There's a whole lot more claims that go in and very little money that comes out. So somebody has to do something. And I believe the mentality that we've been up against, and I know they also recognize this in that study, is a lot of these problems are lower to middle income areas. Well, that doesn't mean that these people don't matter. But I can take you with the numbers I just shared about Midlothian, which is our population is 14,500. The next up, upstream, which is where our water comes from, they have um, twice the amount of residents. Their income is, you know, 73,000 is an average medium income. It's, it's 73 instead of ours, which is 61. And then you go one more neighborhood over where the water is still coming from, and their population is 56,000 in comparison to, to our 14,000. And their average household income is 76,000. So all that water is being dumped on us. We have no budget or money in our village that is ever going to be able to fit what the other people are building and their watershed is increasing and coming our direction. So all we can do at this point is look at the fact, I encourage everybody to keep very, very precise records. Most people have a phone by now. If you don't, you can still use a camera of some sort. Document, document, document. When I first called you and I called Metropolitan Water Reclamation District and I called Illinois Department of Natural Resources and going down the list of anybody that has any, any relevance to water management, I was told that our problem wasn't even in their database. So how could my own village tell all of us from 1988 to 2013 that they were working on something when in fact nobody knew it existed? So then that brought the burden of proof back to us and thank goodness we had all been um, taking, you know, photos and documenting all along. And I think your pursuit needs to be well documented. And I know I have some of my stuff out. Can I just show something? So, yeah. for instance, we make these photo boards. And these we thought were pretty cool. And this way, 
we have public outreach events and you know we can show this is my house these are my neighbors look at all this water what day did this happen and we go on and on and on and we have so so many of those photo boards and all the pictures that are taken are time stamped and digitally you know the information is digitally available through your devices because i've been called everything under the sun from my upstream community who said I was making this up. I had videos of all kinds of things that were going on with a detention pond and pumps that shouldn't have been happening. And I, you know, um, it was bad. You just had to keep taking pictures because eventually you can't outweigh the fact. So um, documentation is very important Staying visible is very important, which is why we marched in every parade twice a year since 2013, because oh, uh, all the yard signs and the banners as well. We had our little yard signs out and people started coming to my house, knocking on the door. Um, some of the shirts I had made, actually, the Team Fodolkian shirts, I'd be out in every storm. Um, I had those bright, bright pink rain boots and eventually that became, you know, easy to recognize they they i just couldn't even believe how people found me i felt like an insane flood magnet at one point because hundreds of people reached out even uh, elected officials from another community um came to me and said um i'd like to work with you because i can't get my own mayor and the other council members to help me she told me where she lived which was you know, I understood what was happening where she lived, and so it was interesting who reached out. But more than anything, the heartbreaking part was no matter how hard we worked, we still watched a lot of people foreclose who couldn't take it anymore. And we watched more people move into those houses, and we watched more building permits be given out to rebuild what our building department knew. They knew. They knew. And there were difficult and horrible discussions because at the end of the day i just don't understand how any human being could put another human being at risk to losing it all when you've seen it over and over and over at the same addresses and um i think another thing that i've learned in all of this is um, the almighty dollar revenue seems to always proceed doing the right thing to fix what you've already done. Um, I had a lot of people give me photos, you know, that are kind of historical. And here's one, if I could just show it. This is in 1953. And wow. when they built my house and the house next door, right next to this, this had been happening since 1953. Now, to even get a little crazier, on the other side of me, a building superintendent lives. On the other side of that, a trustee lives. They knew this flooded from the beginning of time and yet they handed out two more permits. Shame on them. I shouldn't even be having this conversation. <laughs> you know, um, they shouldn't still be, we're, we're in the same boat right now um, with a house around the corner that was on fire. It's flooded horribly, it's more than 100 years old, it takes in about four feet of water. Um, if they hand out a permit to elevate that house, I'm gonna scratch my eyes out because they wanna elevate a house now, which means the four feet of water that was sitting in that open basement is now going to be shared with the rest of us. Why am I still trying to beg building professionals who should know better? And that's why this feels like it never ends. And I do believe we've had a lot of sacrifice um, in our own personal lives, our small group, to get where we are. And to walk away now would just seem like a very big waste of time in our sacrifices to not finish the job. But um, moving forward with another election coming next year, you know, that's that's another thing we have to um, take a good look at. And nobody likes to rack the boat, but 
you know, we, we need again, select somebody who is going to see this through and we need strong leadership. I don't know if you remember this, but a lot of times we would go to meetings and people would say, well, if your problem is so bad, why don't you have village representation? Where's your mayor? Where's alderman? Where's anybody? You know, and I would always say, I'm sorry, I've been asking them since 1988. We are blood orphans and we're here to speak for ourselves. We have our evidence. We'd like to, you know, um, present that to you. And sadly, when you get, you start to get your successes, all of a sudden everybody wants to stand with you. Everybody wants to celebrate. Everybody wants to be in that picture with that big 17 foot or we hauled all over the place. Everybody wants to be a part of the good. But at the end of the day, you go back home and nobody's there at the table. Nobody's, you know, at the meetings. Nobody's bringing anything back to the table. And so that's what we need to work on again. I need an elected official who is going to be at those tables and be doing their best. Um, right now we have one trustee who wears, you know, two dozen hats because we live in a small village and, you know, a, a lot of the trustees have to do more than one job, but this is not a one person job. Nowhere is this a one person job. This is a collaborative effort. I think, you know, we would all say that what was very important here is a strong group of productive residents working with a strong group of elected officials from local to county to state to federal with these agencies if we could all work together that's what made this work for us when we got our state representative on board and he reached out and started you know requesting people to come to meetings and we were able to present this bigger picture as a whole to everybody in the same room, so much came out of that. But then what? Then what? We can't have our own leadership here just say, well, that was fun and walk away. We need people to stay front and center with us. We have four, four big problems in our village with flooding. So I'm going to say, you know, those four different sections, four separate problems. This multi-million dollar project that we landed is only going to help approximately half of the people in that watershed. And while it's amazing and we're grateful, we're still working on how do we fix the rest of that. Then we have a study in one of the other areas, but it's been seven years of us pounding the pavement. We need an elected official who's going to be right there with us, you know, learning as much as they can, going out, pursuing these meetings, forming relationships, getting to know their problems so they can represent it well, as well as making those connections. So we have a stormwater capital plan. We've identified, I believe it's more than 30 potential projects for our other areas. But why is it still the same five, six people, residents, and one trustee sitting at a table trying to make it all happen. It's hard. And that's why all of these people get discouraged. Yes. It's so, yeah, every time, every time you do special, sorry. I can't hear you. Ah. That's weird. I'm not sure what I can do. There you go. I hear you now. Let me. Hello? Yes. Yeah, that's funny. I can still hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe you better do this anything. I've got this weird feedback. It says your bandwidth is low on my screen. Your network bandwidth is low. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm going to have to say I don't know what I'm going to Okay, we'll have to do a part two, Harriet. Oh, thank you so much. Have a good day. Let's, I'll just stop there.